So very good evening, all of you. I'm sorry we had a small technical glitch. Uh, my audio was not visible, audible for most of them. So I hope that uh, right now the audio is all fine. So shall we continue right now? So thank you so much for your patience. And once again, welcome to this uh, INI uh, CET Sure Shot uh, Dermatology Revision. So I'm Dr. Jazeer Abdul Kader, your dermatology faculty at uh, PW Medit. So today what is the plan is that uh, we'll be discussing about some of the previous year questions uh, that has come in INICET. Also I'll be going through some of the important topics, high yield topics in dermatology. So I hope that all the previous sessions were uh, of much uh, use for you. And uh, thank you so much Abhishek, uh, thank you so much Akash, Dr. P. Hu for confirming that uh, the audio and video is all fine now. So let me just begin with the first question for you. So the first question is a match the following like they have given you a disease condition and they have asked you to match it along with the uh, kind of scaling that is associated. Now what are scaling disorders in dermatology? The scaling disorders in dermatology means these are papillosquamous diseases. Now how many papillosquamous diseases do you know like the scaling disorders? So papillosquamous diseases means these are the diseases like psoriasis, lichen planus, pityriasis rubra pilaris etc. Isn't it? So all these are examples of papillosquamous diseases. So in dermatology we have certain diseases where the scaling is compared with something. So that is being asked in this question. So I'll just uh, move this a little above so that the entire thing is visible for you. So these are the options like Pityriasis rosea, Pityriasis versicolor, psoriasis and Pityriasis lichenoides. So whenever you get such a question which is like a match the following. Now how are you going to deal with it? So how you will be dealing with it is in such a way that in Pityriasis rosea do you remember what is the type of scaling that is seen? These are the scales which are present over the periphery of the lesion and these are called as collaret of scales. These are called as collaret of scales. Now let us see what is the second option. In pityriasis versicolor. In pityriasis versicolor. In pityriasis versicolor. What is pityriasis versicolor? It is a fungal infection also called as tinea versicolor. So in tinea versicolor you can see those fine powdery kind of branny scales. So you can see fine powdery branny scales. Isn't it? Now let us see the next one. What is the type of scaling that you see in psoriasis? Now all of us know very well that in psoriasis what is the type of scaling? Yes, you get that silvery white scales over the extensor surfaces, right? So these are silvery white scaling over extensors, over the extensor surfaces. So this is how you can see the entire thing. So now let us see that uh, in this MCQ, like one that is pityriasis rosea can be matched with D. So in, in both these options A and B it is going to be 1D which means you can easily rule out C and D isn't it. Now let us see what is going to happen with the uh, A and B. Pityriasis versicolor we meant that this is going to be branny scales isn't it. This is going to be branny scales. So B uh, 2 is going to be C. So 2 is going to be C so obviously 3 is going to be A and uh, 4 is going to be B so that is uh, the first answer is going to be A isn't it the first answer is going to be A so that is about the first MCQ so I hope that you got the point in so in this MCQ they have discussed about four of the diseases about the peculiarity of the scaling about the peculiarity of the scaling now let's see the next one now which of the following will be associated with the Kasovitz law? So which of the following is going to be associated with the Kasovitz law? So who can answer? Yeah, so just a minute. The background is not visible properly. One minute. My screen, right? So it has gone to one corner. Yeah, I'm just getting it ready. So which of the following will be associated with 
cash so it's low who can answer so shubham is answering it as b dr p who is answering it as b so what is the right answer now first let us try to understand that all the options is going to be syphilis so this is something that is related with syphilis right so in syphilis what happens is that what is kasovitz law so let us see what is kasovitz law that if a woman with untreated syphilis has a series of pregnancy so a woman with untreated syphilis is having a series of pregnancy the likelihood of the infection in the fetus in the later pregnancies becomes less so becomes less so that is what is meant by kasovitz law so what is what do you mean by this that a patient did not take treatment for syphilis and she conceives so don't you think that in the first pregnancy there is a high chance of abortion yes so don't you think that there is a high chance of a stillbirth yes but what happens with the consequent pregnancies so with the consequent pregnancies what happens is that the likelihood that the baby is born with a normal features is more likely so this is called as kasovitz law and this is seen in association with congenital syphilis so this is seen in association with congenital syphilis so dr p who is also explaining the same so it is very correct that uh, it is seen in association with congenital syphilis now let's move to the next one so in the next one you can see that uh, the image that is given below it depicts the characteristic skin finding which can be observed in juvenile dermatomyositis in juvenile dermatomyositis now what are the skin features that you can see in juvenile dermatomyositis now let us see the options also gotrans papules photosensitivity nail bed capillaries and the last one is malar rash now where do you find all these things in dermatomyositis what do you think is the most characteristic type of a skin lesion the most characteristic type of a skin lesion in dermatomyositis yes yes it is simple what is the answer so most of you are answering it as a exactly so sanjay dr aditya nitya dr p who so all of you are answering that the characteristic is going to be gotrans papules now what is gotrans papules you can see in this image so in this image you can see a violaceous or a reddish colored plaque lesion that is present over the joints isn't it like the metacarpophalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints so this kind of a rash which you can see in dermatomyositis these are called as the gotrans papules now whereas what is the color of the erythema over the face so do you think that in dermatomyositis there is photosensitivity just let me know do you think that there is photosensitivity when it comes to dermatomyositis what is the answer yes so in dermatomyositis also you may get a photosensitivity and what is the color of the rash the color of the rash would be a purple color isn't it purple colored rash can be seen now where do you find this malar rash it's a very simple thing so malar rash is seen in sle isn't it so with the sparing of the nasolabial folds the malar rash can be seen in sle so now let's move to the next question that is a pregnant female who was started on treatment for leprosy was found to have type 2 lepra reaction now what would be the next line of management in this patient so the question says that the patient is going to be a pregnant female and then the patient is already having a type 2 lepra reaction so the diagnosis is confirmed here so this is a patient with type 2 lepra reaction but the caution is the patient is pregnant now what is the management now who can answer this question so the options are thalidomide stop leprosy drugs and add steroids continue anti leprosy drugs and add steroids and thalidomide plus steroids what is the right answer i'm just giving you some time to make a guess so here the right answer would be what is a drug of choice when it comes to lepra reaction be it lepra reaction type 1 or be it lepra reaction type 2 in both these type of lepra reaction our drug of choice that is the drug of choice is going to be steroids but is lepra reaction a drug reaction 
Absolutely not. So since lepra reaction is not a drug reaction, we always will have to continue on the multidrug therapy and we have to start on steroids. That is a management. And even though this patient is a pregnant female, still steroid is going to be safe in this case. So what is the right answer? Continue anti-leprosy drugs and add steroids. Now what is the problem with thalidomide? What is the problem with thalidomide? So is it safe to be given in pregnancy or do, is it a drug that we have to avoid in pregnancy? So obviously this is a drug which has a teratogenicity. It has a teratogenic effect and the baby may be born with sealed limbs, isn't it? So this is teratogenic and the baby may be born with sealed limbs. Sealed limbs. Fine. So now let us try to understand some things about this lepra reaction type 1 and lepra reaction type 2 because this is quite an important topic which you can expect in the coming INICT exam as well. So what is this type 1 lepra reaction? Type 1 lepra reaction is also called as a reversal reaction and what is the type of hypersensitivity? The type of hypersensitivity that is seen in type 1 is type 4 hypersensitivity Whereas the type of hypersensitivity that you can see in type 2 is type 3 hypersensitivity. How do you remember this? You can remember it as 1 plus 4 equals to 5 and 2 plus 3 equals to 5. So type 1 is type 4 and type 2 is type 3. Now which are the type of patients who may show this type 1 lepra reaction? So type 1 lepra reaction is shown by all the types of borderline cases. So how many borderline cases do you see? So borderline means this is BT type of leprosy, BB type of leprosy and BL type of leprosy. All the borderline cases can show type 1 lepra reaction. Now what about type 2 lepra reaction? In this type 2 lepra reaction, this can be seen in all types of lepromatous leprosy. So which is the type of lepromatous leprosy that you know? So lepromatous leprosy, this is going to be borderline lepromatous and lepromatous leprosy. So very good Dr. P. Hu. So these are the two types where you can see this type 2 lepra reaction. Now the skin lesions, what happens to the skin lesion? So the existing skin lesions, the existing skin lesions, they become swollen and inflamed in the case of type 1 lepra reaction. So just imagine that there is a patient of BT type of leprosy who is having a, a hypopigmented patch and this hypopigmented patch may become swollen and inflamed when, when it comes to type 1 lepra reaction. Whereas what is going to happen in the type, type 2 lepra reaction? See the other name of type 2 lepra reaction. It is also called as erythema nodosum leprosum. So what you can see is you can see painful subcutaneous nodules over the anterior part of the leg. So you can see a painful subcutaneous nodules over the anterior part of the leg and that is what is seen in type 2 lepra reaction. And what is asked in this MCQ is that what is the drug of choice? In both these cases, there is only one drug of choice and the drug of choice is going to be steroids. So on the day of exam, if they ask you whether it is going to be lepra type 1 reaction or type 2 lepra reaction, be it both, the answer is going to be steroids. And will you stop the treatment of leprosy? Will you stop the multidrug therapy? Absolutely no. Because lepra reaction is not a drug reaction. Because lepra reaction is not a drug reaction. So very good. So now let's move to the next question. So this next question says that a patient was found to have a whitish lesions in the upper limb as seen in this image. And these kind of lesions are also present on the penile shaft. What is the most probable diagnosis? So can you give it a try? So whenever you see any image in dermatology, just try to, you know, uh, try to describe this rash. Okay, try to describe the lesion. So what you can see that there is multiple whitish 
pin pointed papules that is seen over the upper limbs like the elbow area and these kind of lesions are also seen on the penile shaft so what is the likely diagnosis anyone give it a try so lichen nitidus yes so obviously this is not scabies right so why is this not scabies because in scabies what is the type of lesion that you are going to see you are going to see in between the finger webs so in between the finger webs what is the kind of lesion that you see in scabies the typical skin lesion the typical skin lesion that you see in scabies is called as anyone yes pihu nitya all of you are right now my question is what is the typical skin lesion in scabies so the typical skin lesion in scabies is called as the burrows isn't it these are the s shaped serpiginous pathway lichen scrofulosorum is something that is associated with tuberculosis that is uh, it gives you a hint of tuberculosis in the anywhere in the body so that is something different now this one is going to be lichen nitidus so this one is going to be lichen nitidus now what will happen in lichen nitidus in lichen nitidus so if you if you see a patient something like this just focus on this uh, yeah very good dr shubham dr p who all of you are answering it right so just see what is happening in this image so in this image what you can see right now is that there are multiple pin pointed papules that is present over the elbow and if there are these kind of papules if you do a histopathology like you excise some portion of the skin if you send it for histopathology you can see a very typical histopathology in these kind of lichen nitidus patients and what is a clue the clue is that what i'm whatever i'm showing to you right now over the screen so this is the clue of what is a histopathology finding in lichen nitidus just imagine that this is a ball and this is a claw so this is a claw clutching a ball appearance so this is a claw clutching the ball appearance that you can see in the histopathology of lichen nitidus so histopathology would be claw clutching the ball appearance claw clutching the ball appearance can be seen in lichen nitidus fine so that is all about this mcq as well so just a minute so now let's move to the next one so this next one says that there is a 30 year old male so this patient it was admitted with vesicular lesions and uh, these lesions were distributed in the chest region over a single dermatome and the patient is also complaining of pain what is the probable diagnosis easy question right so what is the probable diagnosis here so you can see that that this patient is having vesicular lesions like this and these vesicular lesions they are not crossing the midline and these are all present in a single dermatome so this is going to be the reactivation of varicella virus now what is the reactivation of varicella virus called as yes it is called as the herpes zoster so this is called as the herpes zoster so don't make a mistake it is not herpes simplex because herpes simplex is different hsv where you get multiple vesicles over the skin but this is the reactivation what is this this is the reactivation of varicella virus so where was this uh, varicella virus being residing in the body because the first infection with varicella the first infection what is it called as the first infection is called as chicken pox isn't it the first infection is called as chicken pox the reactivation is called as herpes zoster the reactivation is called as herpes zoster now what is the most common complaint of the patient who will have herpes zoster so the most common complaint of the patient who is going to have a herpes zoster is going to be a burning pain 
it is going to be burning pain so once you examine the skin of the patient what can you see so in these kind of patients you can see that there are grouped vesicles on erythematous base on a dermatomal distribution on a dermatomal distribution on a dermatomal distribution this is how a patient may present to you a severe pain burning kind of a pain the patient comes to you now what is the first advice that you will give or what are you going to tell the patient that which is the most common complication of this condition so the next question is what is the most common complication of this condition the most common complication of this condition very good bhargavi dr p who or of you are answering this is going to be post herpetic neuralgia this is going to be post herpetic neuralgia and whenever a patient is having this post herpetic neuralgia what is the drug of choice now what is the drug of choice to treat this post herpetic neuralgia who can answer so the more so how do you treat this post herpetic neuralgia now what do you mean by post herpetic neuralgia that means that the pain is going to persist even after the lesions would disappear so what is the treatment of this post herpetic neuralgia this is going to be gabapentin so the treatment is going to be gabapentin very good so yes bhargavi like herpes zoster ophthalmicus is possible ramse hunt syndrome is possible so all these are the complications of herpes zoster now what is the drug of choice in herpes zoster what is the drug of choice of herpes zoster come on in the chat box hmm very good very good all of you so the drug of choice of herpes zoster as vinay is saying is that this is going to be acyclovir so this is going to be acyclovir excellent so now let's move to the next question now this next question says that there is a 65 year old patient who is presenting with a tense bulla which settled down after some time so what is the probable diagnosis so what do you see here 65 year old patient and the biggest clue here whenever remember whenever you get a vesicular bullous disease and if the mcq is going to describe the type of bulla it is going to describe the bulla as either a flaccid bulla flaccid means which can break very easily or it is going to describe as a tense bulla which means it does not break very easily so here you can see that this is mentioning as a tense bulla so if it is a tense bulla what is the right answer here so vinay kesush all of you are answering so tense bulla means so this is going to be bullous pemphigoid so why the bulla in bullous pemphigoid is a tense bulla why does it not break so easily the answer is because this bulla is formed below the epidermis not within the epidermis because in the skin you know that the outermost layer is the epidermis then comes the dermis and then the subcutaneous tissue now where is the bulla formed in bullous pemphigoid it is formed below the epidermis and that is why the re the reason why we call this bulla as a tense bulla which does not break very easily now let us quickly try to see what are the basic differences because whenever they ask you some questions on vesicular bullous disease they usually would ask you about pemphigus foliaceus pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid let us try to understand what is the important things here so when it comes to pemphigus foliaceus where is the defect like what is the defect of pemphigus foliaceus options are desmoglein 1 desmoglein 3 uh, bpag 1 bpag 2 who can answer pemphigus foliaceus yes in pemphigus foliaceus the defect is going to be in desmoglein 1 whereas in pemphigus vulgaris where is the defect in pemphigus vulgaris the defect is going to be in pem desmoglein 3 more than desmoglein 1 okay desmoglein 3 more than desmoglein 
and what is the defect in bullous pemphigoid in bullous pemphigoid this is going to be a defect of bpag2 more than bpag1 excellent so all of you are answering in the chat box very good good going so what is happening here is these are the basic defects in all these very important three vesiculobullous diseases now what is the site of defect can you tell me very quickly like which are the two diseases where you have a intra epidermal defect like the defect is within the epidermis yes so here in both these cases this is going to be intra epidermal whereas what is happening in the case of uh, bullous pemphigoid this is below the epidermis which is also called as sub epidermal sub epidermal defect fine now because of this uh, the area where this defect is present now can you tell me where can we find very flaccid bulla and where can we find a flaccid bulla yes the answer here is the type of bulla that you can see in pemphigus foliaceus is going to be very flaccid which means it is going to break very easily whereas in pemphigus vulgaris you can see a flaccid bulla and just like the mcq what we have dealt just now you can see a tense bulla when it comes to bullous pemphigoid when it comes to bullous pemphigoid <clears throat> so is that clear so yeah many more additional points are being discussed here in the chat box like uh, nikolsky sign very good whenever you apply a tangential pressure over the skin if the skin would peel off this is called as a nikolsky sign so in pemphigus that is in pemphigus vulgaris as well as in pemphigus foliaceus you can see nikolsky sign positive whereas nikolsky sign may be negative in the case of bullous pemphigoid because you get a tense bulla very good so shall i continue further good so now let's see the next question that a 62 year old male patient presents to the opd with the finding that is seen in this image now he was a known hypertensive patient and with a history of atrial fibrillation now his current med medications it includes atenolol captopril aspirin and amiodarone what is the probable diagnosis now i'll just show you this image as well now we have a elderly patient who is hypertensive and he is taking on multiple anti anti hypertensive drugs now this probably is a drug reaction that they are asking about and then what is the correct diagnosis here who can answer so blue man syndrome amiodarone says bhargavi so vinay met psycho all of you are answering it so this is the right answer that is amiodarone induced skin lesion now what is the color of this lesion yes so there is a slate colored or bluish gray or bluish gray lesion that usually happens on intake of amiodarone okay this is happening with amiodarone okay this is blue colored bluish gray or a slate colored lesion that appears usually it appears after the patient goes to the sun so there is some phototoxicity or some photoallergy that is associated with amiodarone and the patient's entire skin or this uh, sun exposed area may turn out to be a slate gray in color so this is called as amiodarone induced skin lesion now in case they go a little deeper now what can happen is this kind of a uh, lesion what is the first step in management who can say what is the first step in management so all of you i agree that all of you are able to say that the answer is d amiodarone now what is the first step in management so the treatment would be the first one would be yes whenever there is a drug reaction the answer would be stop the offending drug so we have to stop amiodarone so that is the first step but the problem with this bluish gray color discoloration is that in most of the patients it may persist for a longer duration of time like it can even persist for about 2 years of time so in such cases what is the treatment that you can give so you can go for a q switched laser therapy so here the treatment would be q switched laser therapy 
so q switched ndr laser can be used q switched ruby laser can be used all these are the treatment that is possible whenever there is this hyperpigmentation that is going to last for a longer period of time fine so this is all about amiodaron induced skin reaction very good very good so dr bargavi all of you are answering it right now among all these options i just wonder if if you know about this thing that is called lupus perneo so what is lupus perneo who can answer what is lupus perneo so lupus perneo is some something that is related to the skin also it can be seen over the nose in a violaceous color now what is it most commonly associated with so what is it most commonly associated with so this is most commonly associated with sarcoidosis so this is the most characteristic skin lesion that you can see in association with sarcoidosis okay and again the patient can complain of a uh, erythematous or a violaceous kind of a rash over the face especially over the nose and this is called as lupus perneo lupus perneo now let's see this next question the histo the histological picture that is given below will be associated with the following condition leprosy pemphigus vulgaris leishmaniasis mycosis fungoides so what is the right answer here so let us zoom this image just to see what is happening in this histopathological slide so in this histopathological slide you can see that there is a split can you see that there is a split here so where is the split happening over the skin so this is the stratum basal and just above the stratum basal there is a split that is happening which means this can be essentially uh, mentioned as a supra basal split so this can be mentioned as a supra basal split now in which disease do you see a supra basal split exactly so this can be seen in pemphigus vulgaris very good this can be seen in pemphigus vulgaris now what is happening here to the stratum basal in the histopathology like you know that there are columnar basal cells isn't it there are columnar basal cell basal keratinocytes in the stratum basal now whenever there is a split just above the stratum basal what happens is that these cells get separated from one another now these kind of cells which is getting separated from one another what do you compare it to when the basal keratinocytes get separated and then they are uh, away from one another what is it compared to yes these are compared to a row of tombstones appearance like the graveyard isn't it row of tombstones appearance that you see in pemphigus vulgaris so this is a very typical histopathological feature of pemphigus vulgaris where you can see a row of tombstones yes these are acantholysis means the cell to cell adhesion of the keratinocytes is lost the cell to cell adhesion of the keratinocytes is lost can anybody tell me what is the dif finding in pemphigus vulgaris so can you recollect what was the direct immunofluorescence finding in pemphigus vulgaris exactly so what is the defect in pemphigus vulgaris the defect was in desmoglein 3 and desmoglein 1 so where is desmoglein 3 and where is desmoglein 1 present these are present within the epidermis so in this epidermis what happens the entire defect will take up the greenish fluorescence and you can see what kind of a pattern the kind of pattern that you can see is called as a chicken wire pattern okay this is called as a chicken wire pattern isn't it and what is being deposited here igg and c3 is deposited in the epidermis in the epidermis very good so please make sure that uh, don't make a mistake there is no linear pattern okay so please don't make a mistake so the correct answer would be it can be either compared to a chicken wire or you can compare it to a fish net 
or you can compare it to a fish net so this is seen in the epidermis where do you find a linear deposition linear deposition is always present when there is a defect in the uh, basement membrane zone like the when there is a defect below the epidermis like in bullous pemphigoid like in bullous pemphigoid so this is the right answer here so now let's move to the next question so on examination a child was found to have a itchy and a scaly bald patch okay itchy and a scaly bald patch so which among the following investigations would be required yeah what is the right answer so whenever there is a child who complains of a itchy scalp or there is some that is associated with scaling and some loss of hair what comes to our mind so the diagnosis that comes to our mind is always going to be something like a tinea capitis isn't it like tinea capitis so whenever there is tinea capitis what are the types of tinea capitis these are the black dot these are the gray patch and uh, then it can be kirion and it can be favus and it can be favus so these are the types of tinea capitis that can be seen now whenever you're suspecting a fungal infection where there is some kind of a scaling itchiness and all what is the investigation of choice of any type of a fungal infection so the investigation of choice here would be koh mount koh mount so in this koh mound is going to be our investigation of choice now among all these type of tinea capitis which i have listed right now hmm? yes very good uh, dr bargavi so among all these things which has been listed right now can you tell me which is the most common type of tinea capitis is it black dot is it gray patch is it kirion is it favors so the most common type is going to be black dot okay the most common type is going to be black dot now among all these four types can you tell me which is the type that can lead to a scarring alopecia so which is the type that can lead to a scarring alopecia yes scarring alopecia is associated with kirion so this can be associated with scarring alopecia so kirion is associated with scarring alopecia so yes as uh, dr bhargavi says what happens in a kirion there is a tender boggy swelling of the scalp so there may be a child who complains of a painful swelling of the scalp and this is also going to be koh positive in all these cases of tinea capitis what is the drug of choice who can answer so med psycho dr p who bargavi now who can answer this what is the drug of choice in tinea capitis if you want options i can give you a few options as well is it itraconazole it is is it ketoconazole is it griseofulvin or is it terbinafin so what is the drug of choice when it comes to tinea capitis when it comes to tinea capitis please remember that the drug of choice is going to be griseofulvin so the drug of choice is going to be griseofulvin very good so subhajit bishwas is answering it right so the right answer here would be griseofulvin so remember in all types of tinea for example tinea manum tinea corporis tinea pedis everything the drug of choice is going to be terbinafin whereas in tinea capitis the drug of choice is going to be griseofulvin so tinea pedis tinea corporis tinea manum so all these things the drug of choice is going to be terbinafin whereas the only exception is tinea capitis where the drug of choice is going to be griseofulvin it's going to be griseofulvin so i hope the entire thing is clear for you so with your permission i'm going to the next question so in a 12 year old boy scaly lesions were observed in the cubital fossa popliteal fossa and also over the neck these lesions were exudative and itchy what would be the most probable diagnosis so here the age is given that it is a 12 year old boy 
and here the lesions are said to be over the uh, flexural aspects like the cubital fossa the popliteal fossa also over the neck now what comes to your mind with this kind of a history and an image is also given where there is a dry skin with some rashes over the probably over the <coughs> popliteal fossa what is the right answer yes so there may be a history of atopy there may be a family history of positive family history as well so here the right answer is going to be atopic dermatitis atopic dermatitis so in atopic dermatitis please remember that on the day of exam they always can twist the question or the site of presentation may differ according to the age of the patient according to the age of the patient now let's try to understand what is the basic differences according to the age of the patient like suppose the age of the patient is from birth to two years where do you find this rash in the infantile lady like we have a six months old child who is having atopic dermatitis where can you see the lesions in an atopic child up to two years of age just just try to remember that these are crawling infants so when they're crawling which part is going to be uh, in touch with the environment that is going to be the extensor surface so this kind of an infantile ad the patient would be having a rash over the face over the scalp and extensors and extensors so this is going to be the commonest area where you find the rash in a patient of infantile ad now what happens in the case of childhood ad and adulthood ad so this thing you can remember it together because in both these things the rash is going to be present over the flexures so in both these things the rash is going to be present over the flexures fine so that is the basic difference so remember two infantile ad matlab extensor surface the face and the scalp whereas uh childhood ad and adulthood ad means the rash is going to be present over the flexural aspects fine so these are the basic differences according to the site and then please remember that on the day of exam usually the examiner like in like in the neat pg exam they always give you a family history of atopy family history of atopy or there may be a personal history of atopy personal history of atopy so family history of atopy or a personal history of atopy very dry skin and this itching uh, scratch cycle scratch it cycle all these things are seen in atopic dermatitis can anybody tell me what is the investigation of choice in atopic dermatitis any guess regarding the investigation of choice investigation of choice in atopic dermatitis so this is the catch here so when it comes to atopic dermatitis there is no investigation of choice there is no investigation of choice because atopic dermatitis is 100% a clinical diagnosis okay it is okay to make mistakes today so it is all fine so please remember whoever is trying excellent keep going keep trying fine so please remember that atopic dermatitis there is no investigation of choice it is 100% a clinical diagnosis so if at all you have to make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis there should be some criteria isn't it so what is the criteria when it comes to atopic dermatitis the criteria is called as honey fin and rajka hanifin and rajka criteria so hanifin and rajka criteria is used for the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis so very good uh, dr pihu so all of you are answering it right so now let's go to the next question a patient was found to have painful vesicles on the genital regions which among the following can be observed in the histopathological examination so what is the right answer patient was found to have a painful vesicles so here the right answer would be so what is the diagnosis first so whenever there is a patient who complains of vesicles painful vesicles what would be the diagnosis the diagnosis here is going to be herpes simplex okay 
or let us say herpes genitalis or herpes simplex so herpes simplex is it caused by hsv1 or hsv2 so herpes simplex can be caused by so many of you are answering it right so evabradine bargavi medpsycho all of you are answering it right that is ballooning of keratinocytes excellent so what happens in herpes simplex the histopathology of herpes simplex will always show ballooning of keratinocytes and cowdery type a bodies can also be seen so this can be seen along with cowdery type a bodies can also be seen fine very good now can you can somebody tell me where do you find henderson petterson bodies like option a where do you find henderson petterson bodies who can answer so this can be seen in molluscum molluscum contagiosum and where do you see coelocytes where do you see coelocytes i'll give you a, a hint coelocytes are seen in another viral illness viral infection yes coelocytes are typically seen in human papilloma virus infection or warts so this is seen in warts fine so coelocytes are seen in warts so in this one the right answer would be ballooning of keratinocytes so just going further a patient presented with a patch on the neck region and in the mandible without crossing the midline and it is associated with the presence of leukotrichia the most probable diagnosis would be so what is the most probable diagnosis here so there is a patch lesion there is no mention whether it is a hypopigmented patch or a hyperpigmented patch but there is some clue there is a patch and there is no crossing of the midline and there is leukotrichia what is the meaning of leukotrichia leuko means white trichia means hair so there is a whitish hair along with the patch lesion so what is the right answer can anybody let me know in the chat box so very good h all of you are answering molluscum molluscum warts and now segmental vitiligo evabradin is answering it as segmental vitiligo how many of you agree it is segmental vitiligo right so when vitiligo we all know that the patient will be having a deep pigmented skin deep pigmented skin and here what is happening in a segmental vitiligo why is it called as segmental because this is going to be along a dermatome this is going to be along a dermatome and then this lesion is not going to cross the midline as well the lesions are not going to cross the midline so now among this yes if the patient would be having a whitish forelock with vitiligo like patches then this means that that can be a autosomal dominant condition called as pibaldism yes very good bargavi so that is also possible now among all these options here the right answer is uh, segmental vitiligo can anybody tell me what is a drug of choice when it comes to vitiligo is it steroids which is a drug of choice or do we have any other choice so what is a drug of choice when it comes to vitiligo yes the drug of choice is going to be a calcineurin inhibitors so how many calcineurin inhibitors do you know so calcineurin inhibitors that is seen is going to be yes so this is going to be tacrolimus or pimicrolimus so both these are going to be calcineurin inhibitors both these are going to be calcineurin inhibitors so please don't make a mistake the drug of choice of vitiligo is going to be calcineurin inhibitors tacrolimus or pimicrolimus now let us see the next question that a patient presented with a patient presented with the following lesion that is shown in this image what is the most probable diagnosis 
see uh, when it comes to uh, puva and b uh, see dr bargavi when it comes to vitiligo i'll just explain it for dr bargavi and then proceed further when it comes to vitiligo what happens is that the drug of choice is always calcineurin inhibitors whereas we can also go for phototherapy so phototherapy narrow band uvb can also be done or puva that is uva can also be done but drug of choice always going to be calcineurin inhibitors now coming back to this question what do you see so the options are lepromatous leprosy tuberculoid leprosy histoid leprosy borderline lepromatous leprosy yes so here as all of you are answering in the chat box the answer is going to be lepromatous type of leprosy what is the name of such kind of a face where you get multiple nodular lesions over the face the face is going to look like a lion and these are called as leonin facies these are called as leonin facies fine now let us see that most probably whenever they give you they give you any image uh, of leprosy they may give you one hint about what is the type of lesion that is being seen so now let us quickly see what are the types of skin lesions that you see in leprosy now the first one is let us talk about tt type of leprosy okay tuberculoid type of leprosy so in tuberculoid type of leprosy what is the type of skin lesion the type of skin lesion that you can see can be compared to a saucer right way up appearance isn't it you can see a saucer right way up appearance when it comes to tuberculoid type of leprosy what about bt type of leprosy in bt type what is the type of lesions that you can see in bt type it is very important because this is the most common type of leprosy in india isn't it so when it comes to most common type of leprosy what is the type of skin lesion that you can see you can see satellite lesions satellite lesions and you can also see pseudopodia finger like projections are also seen so satellite lesions and pseudopodia can also be seen now what about bt is over now the next one is bb type so what do you see in bb type of leprosy so earlier what was it so who can answer saucer shaped so tt b is done bt is done now the next one is bb so here you can see a swiss cheese appearance swiss cheese appearance or this is also called as a inverted saucer inverted saucer appearance so swiss cheese appearance inverted saucer appearance all these are mentioned for borderline borderline type of leprosy that is bb type of leprosy the next one is bl type so in bl type always remember the lesions will almost be, be, be becoming symmetrical so here you can see almost symmetrical lesions almost symmetrical lesions and the last one that is lepromatous type of leprosy where you can see leonin facies and symmetrical skin lesions and symmetrical skin lesions can be seen so that is all about the different types of lesions skin lesions that you see in leprosy so please remember it's a very important slide because they always may ask you like uh, to identify the type of leprosy based on the lesions so please make sure that you revise this properly before you go for your exams okay so that is tt bt bb bl ll so all these are the various types so with that we will now move to the next question so in patients with allergic contact dermatitis what would be the investigation of choice now they have asked you a disease here which is called as allergic contact dermatitis acd so in acd what is the investigation radio immunosorbent or is it patch test or is it radio allergy sorbent testing what is the right answer so the question is here about acd yeah it's a pretty direct question that is this is going to be a patch test so what is a patch test like we will uh, glue a patch 
over the upper back of the patient and we'll be just seeing like what is the patient allergic to so few more questions in the pack. when is the reading taken so is the reading taken immediately or is the reading taken after few minutes few hours few weeks few days when is the when is the reading taken in allergic contact dermatitis this is a measure of type 4 hypersensitivity this is a measure of type 4 hypersensitivity which means there is a delayed type of hypersensitivity that is the reason why why we do the investigation of choice here would be patch test where we will be doing this investigation and we will be checking the skin after 48 hours or after two days so so after two days see uh, here the question is what is the investigation of choice dr pihu so in, in investigation of choice i completely agree that in all these kind of patients with some allergy they may be having an increased ige okay so they may be having an increased ige if you check the blood profile the eosinophils may be increased all these things can be seen but if you have to reach out the proper diagnosis what the patient is allergic to then you have to do this test called as patch test. So once you apply this patch over the upper back of the patient, you ask the patient to go back home and you ask the patient to come back to you after two days because after 48 hours, you are going to examine the skin. What is the change that is happening? So whichever allergen is going to be positive, they will be showing some kind of a reaction over the skin. So this is called as a patch test. And remember, patch test is going to be a measure of type 4 hypersensitivity it is going to be a measure of type 4 hypersensitivity but in case the examiner may ask you when is the best reading taken when is the best reading taken in a patch test then the answer is not 48 hour the later the better fine so here the answer would be 96 hours here the answer would be 96 hours So that is all about allergic contact dermatitis allergic contact dermatitis now i just before we before i go to the next topic i just want to know want to ask you one more question like what is the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis what is the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis can anybody answer this bonus question let me see who can answer this what is the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis so i'll give you a hint this is a plant it's a plant it's called as the parthenium hysterophorus parthenium hysterophorus it's also called as the congress weed isn't it it is also called as the congress weed so this is the most common cause of allergic contact dermatitis allergic contact dermatitis so is that clear so it is not rubber it is not nickel it is not anything else it is not bindi or anything so the answer is parthenium hysterophorus good good going good going all of you now let's see the next one identify the correct statement about chancroid from the following identify the correct statement about chancroid from the following so what is chancroid it is a genital ulcer disease so does it bleed on touch okay so don't worry don't worry no confusions okay so now let, let us come to this question now we have reached a question that is about genital ulcer disease so all of you please concentrate on this question now what is the correct answer here does it bleed on touch is it a painless ulcer does it show a school of fish appearance and is there any groove sign is there any groove sign so Vinay is answering it right that is a school of fish appearance so that is the right answer when it comes to Haemophilus ducreyi or chancroid or chancroid fine now what is the genital ulcer which is beefy red in color and which may bleed to touch can you make a guess 
so which is beefy red in color and which may bleed to touch yes this is seen in donovanosis this is seen in donovanosis and which are the types of painless genital ulcers chancroid is going to be painful so painless genital ulcer you can remember it with a mnemonic that is lsd lsd is a drug so if you take a drug you may not get to know a pain correct so you can try to remember it like that that lsd are the examples of painless genital ulcers and what is l l stands for lgv what is s s stands for syphilis and d stands for donovanosis donovanosis so all these are the examples of painless genital ulcers now the last one where do you find groove sign any idea when there is a inflamed femoral node and the inguinal node there is a groove that forms and this is called as a groove sign and in which disease do you see this groove sign so this is seen in lgv this is seen in lgv so all these are the various important points that you will remember about the various genital ulcer disease now genital ulcer disease since it is a very important topic now what you have to remember is let us try to know like what are the characteristics of the ulcer when it comes to genital ulcer disease the characteristics of the ulcer now first let us see in which disease do you see a painless ulcer with painless lymphadenopathy who can answer so painless ulcer with painless lymphadenopathy can be seen in yes it can be seen in syphilis very good now coming to the next one where do you find a painless transient ulcer followed by a painful lymphadenopathy here what is happening the ulcer is painless but the lymphadenopathy is going to be painful where do you find this remember whenever you say painless ulcer lsd fine so here what is the answer so here this is going to be lgv lgv so in lgv you may get a painful buboes so these are going to be called as painful buboes very good now the next one is multiple painful ulcer with undermined edges and a pay and a, a painful lymphadenopathy so where do you find multiple painful ulcers with a painful lymphadenopathy that is what we have discussed just now in this mcq that there is a painful ulcer school of fish appearance painful lymphadenopathy this is called as chancroid this is also called as chancroid next one where do you find a polycyclic erosions like just exam just imagine that the patient has got multiple vesicles in the genitalia these vesicles have ruptured to form polycyclic erosions and these have become multiple painful genital ulcer with a painful lymphadenopathy so what is the answer here so this is going to be herpes genitalis so this is going to be herpes genitalis and the last one is ulcer that bleeds to touch with a subcutaneous swelling so beefy red ulcer that bleeds to touch just now i have explained you the same that is going to be seen in donovanosis that is seen in donovanosis so once again this is a very important slide for all of you so please make sure that you go through all these clinical scenarios of all the genital ulcer disease because it's a very very important topic it is a repeat topic as well fine so please make sure that if you know these kind of presentations properly then you will never make a mistake okay you will never make a mistake on any of the genital ulcer disease questions so i'm just proceeding further so the next one so the next one is from the given image what is the type of skin lesion so what is what is the type of skin lesion that you can see here in this type of a skin image now this is a rounded skin lesion right so whenever you find a rounded skin lesion how do you call it as do you call it as a nummular annular targetoid or discoid 
so whenever so this is a pretty straight question that was asked so this one is also called as a annular skin lesion so this is also called as the annular skin lesion Now once again there is another question about the genital ulcer disease. So it is a, uh, a repeat question every time. So what is this kind of a lesion called as? So which among the following will cause painful ulcers on the tip of the glands? So which of the following will cause painful ulcers? So painful. So the, what is the easiest way of dealing this question is painless ulcer is going to be LSD. Okay. So with that we know that this is also gone. This is also gone. Isn't it? Now gonorrhea it usually doesn't cause ulcer. What does it cause? It usually causes a genital discharge disease. Isn't it? So this is also ruled out. So which will cause a painful ulcer? Painful ulcer is caused by Haemophilus ducreyi. And what is, the, what is the name of this disease? Caused by Haemophilus ducreyi. So Haemophilus ducreyi will be causing chancroid. So it is actually the same question. So once they asked about the school of fish appearance. Now this is going to be again chancroid. Now this is again going to be chancroid. Now going to the next question. Now from this image given below, what is the most probable hair disorder? Now a similar image was given. So usually in all those common hair findings that we have learned, this, kind, this type of an image doesn't come right so what they have done here is so the options you can see that trichorexis nodosa trichothiodystrophy trichorexis invaginita and <clears throat> all these are the options now in all these options what you can see that all these diseases are hair shaft disorders so all these are hair shaft disorders so all these are hair shaft disorders and this image what you can see over the screen right now which was asked and what is the name of this investigation? This investigation is called as the polarizing microscopy. So this investigation is called as a polarizing microscopy and the reason why this image was given is that there is a typical finding. What does this hair resemble to? So this hair here it resembles to a tiger tail banding. So this resembles to a tiger. It resembles to a tiger tail banding. So this tiger tail banding is seen in trichothiodystrophy. So this is seen in trichothiodystrophy. So here the patient usually will present with short and brittle hairs and this is seen in trichothiodystrophy. Trichothiodystrophy. So this is a, a hair shaft disorder where you can see that the patient's polarizing microscopy was seen and in polarizing microscopy what is the finding there is a tiger tail banding that is seen tiger tail banding is seen fine now going to the next one so from the image that is given below identify the correct statement on the condition so what is the correct statement on this condition here now from this image can you tell me what is your differential diagnosis? What is your differential diagnosis if you are getting such a patient? So just, just tell me one or two differential diagnoses. So here the differential diagnosis would be. So let us say that one of the differential diagnoses is there may be some grouped vesicles which must have ruptured. And in which condition do you see this grouped vesicles? So you can see these kind of a grouped vesicles in herpes labialis. Herpes labialis. 
One of the other differential diagnosis what you should always consider whenever you get these kind of lesions is going to be impetigo. Is going to be impetigo with the golden yellow honey colored crust. Fine. So one is a viral infection. The other is a bacterial infection. So both these can be a differential diagnosis if you are just looking at this image. Okay. So very good. Anisur, Bhargavi, Medpsycho, all of you are answering. Now, keeping these two differential diagnoses in mind. Now let us see what are the options. First one is a sang smear has to be done. Second one is gram negative cocci can be seen. Third one is central umbilication can be seen. And the last one is pun cells can be seen. Now what is the right answer? Now who can guess? So Medpsycho says it is option A. So how many of you agree with Medpsycho? Or how many of you are having a different opinion? Yes. So here since there is a grouped vesicles on erythematous base the most likely diagnosis here can be a herpes labialis so whenever there is a herpes labialis we can always go for a sang smear so we can always go for a sang smear so in hsv if you do a sang smear if you do a sang smear what are the findings that you see in a sang smear in hsv so what is the finding so the finding is going to be MNG cells. What is the meaning of MNG cells? MNG cells means multi nucleated giant cells. So multi nucleated giant cells can be seen. Isn't it? Why the answer is not the second one? Gram negative cocci can be seen. Because in case the patient's diagnosis was impetigo, it would have been gram positive cocci, isn't it? Gram positive cocci, not gram negative. And why it is not central umbilication? In which disease did you learn about central umbilication? Can anyone answer? Like where did you learn about central umbilication? So yes, central umbilication can be seen in molluscum contagiosum. So this is seen in molluscum. Molluscum contagiosum. And these kind of pun cells, where do you find these pun cells? You can see in donovanosis, donovan bodies. Remember the closed safety pin appearance of the donovan bodies. So where are these bodies present? These are present within the pun cells, isn't it? These are large mononuclear cells. So these are also not the answer. So here the right answer is going to be option A. That is Sang smear has to be done. So very good. All of you. Anisur, Medpsycho, Bhargavi. All of you are answering. So please make sure that. Um, yeah. All of you are right. So now let's see the next question. That a patient was found to have a subepidermal blister along with neutrophils that is positioned at the tip of the dermal papilla so which among the following is going to be the treatment of choice so there is this patient who is having a sub epidermal blister along with neutrophils so in where did you learn about the, the easiest way is now in this MCQ you have seen that there is some neutrophils over the dermal papilla. So where did you learn about neutrophilic abscess or neutrophilic micro abscess in dermatology? Do you remember? So there are two examples of neutrophilic micro abscess in dermatology. The first example is in psoriasis. Remember? Yes, the first example is in psoriasis where you can see neutrophilic microabscess called as Mundros microabscess and also Kogoch, spongy form pustule of Kogoch. Spongy form pustule of Kogoch. So this is one disease that is psoriasis where you can see a neutrophilic microabscess. The other example where you can see a neutrophilic microabscess is a disease called as dermatitis herpetiformis. 
that is dermatitis herpetiformis so in dermatitis herpetiformis where do you find what is the type of neutrophilic microabscess you can see neutrophilic microabscess over the papillary tips papillary tip microabscess can be seen papillary tip microabscess can be seen in dermatitis micro dermatitis herpetiformis yes bhagavi very good see remember uh, potrius microabscess that is a mycosis fungoides but please remember that potrius microabscess is not neutrophilic what is the type of cell that you see in potrius microabscess the options are neutrophils lymphocytes eosinophils can you answer potrius microabscess are lymphocytes that is seen in mycosis fungoides that is seen in mycosis fungoides now let us come back to this question that the patient is having sub epidermal blisters that is the blisters are formed below the epidermis and then there are neutrophils that is present in the dermal papilla so what is the treatment of choice so here the diagnosis is going to be dermatitis herpetiformis and in dermatitis herpetiformis the drug of choice is going to be dapsone the drug of choice is going to be dapsone so very good anisul nabi bargavi all of you are answering it right now i just want to ask you one more question like in which other vesicular bullous disease do we use dapsone in treatment one is dermatitis herpetiformis so is there any other vesicular bullous disease where we can use dapsone for treatment who can answer so another disease where we can use dapsone for treatment would be anyone so this one can also be used in linear iga disease so in linear iga disease also the drug of choice is going to be dapsone so remember these are the two diseases in vesicular bullous chapter where dapsone is a drug of choice one is dermatitis herpetiformis and the other one is going to be linear iga disease linear iga disease so i think with that uh, we are coming towards the end of our discussion so tomorrow at the same time you will be having uh, <coughs> anesthesia revision with dr vinish and um, please make sure that um, practice makes you perfect right so please make sure that uh, you go through the pw medded uh, grand test so the next grand test is going to be on the 1st of uh, may we also have another grand test on the 30th of april as well so 30th april 1st may and 2nd may all these grand tests also and uh, continue following all the uh, channels of uh, pw medded and uh, thank you so much for your patience and i wish you all the very best for your exams so i'll see you again in the next uh, live session thank you so much yeah just a minute yes anisul nabi thank you so much uh, med psycho Okay thank you so much